Now, at the end of the Samnite Wars, Rome, as I said, has established control over much of Campania, and at the same time, there's been a major influx in the number of people who have moved to Rome. So there's warfare throughout central Italy, there are a lot of refugees who were taking shelter in Rome, and there were a lot of slaves that are moving into Rome. So the city the city's population probably doubled in size in the course of the 4th century BC. Some have estimated that it was probably around 60,000 people by the end of the 4th century BC, but some have said that it must have been much larger. In any event, if you're now moving into Campania, areas further to the south, you need a good road, and if you've doubled the size of your population, you need more water so that everyone has sufficient drinking water. And there was a censor named Appius Claudius Caicus in the late 4th century who did both of these things. Building the Via Appia, which of course we still have today, which extended Rome's um, ability to move quickly and efficiently into Campania and ultimately to the Adriatic Sea, and then the Aqua Appia, both of these uh, complexes are named after him, Aqua Appia, Via Appia, Appius Claudius Titus. Um, the Aqua Appia would channel water from east of Rome to the Forum Boarium, the so-called cattle market, which is right on the east side of the Tiber River. Now, as we move into the third century, Rome's area of conquest expands dramatically. During the wars with Pyrrhus of Epirus, about whom I'll say more in a minute, Rome acquires control of much of southern Italy, and even more in the course of the first and second Punic Wars in the middle and late third centuries BC. <clears throat> so by the end of the third century BC, Rome has control of all of peninsular Italy, virtually all of Sicily, part of North Africa, and a large part of Spain. And the third century BC is flanked by the import of two very interesting so-called foreign deities. Rome had an ambivalent relationship with foreign deities. In the 5th century BC, there's a new law, it's I think 428 BC, where the Roman Senate says no new foreign cults, because clearly too many of them were coming into the city. But in the 3rd century, at the beginning of the 3rd and at the end of the 3rd, they reach out to two gods in particular who would always have an important role in the life of the city. The first, in 291 BC, was the healing god Asclepius, who was brought from the Greek sanctuary of Epidaurus to the city of Rome. And as a healing god, one would go to his sanctuaries and liaise with his priests to find uh, a solution to one's physical ailments. And it wasn't uncommon to dedicate votives made of clay, representing the part of your body that was problematic. And so in the sanctuaries of Asclepius, or the sanctuaries of any healing god, you'll find terracotta anatomical votives, as we, call, as we call them, and we've got plenty of them on display in the Etruscan gallery upstairs. So you'll see a foot, or lips, or an ear, or an eye, or a finger, or a hand, or a penis, or a vagina. Whatever the problem was, you render it in clay and you dedicate it to the god to say, this is my problem, help me. And when the cult comes into the city, they install it on Tiber Island, which of course was a very smart move because the, sanctuary, the sanctuaries of Asclepius were also early hospitals. So this enabled the sick people to get treatment in the city, but separated from the primary areas of habitation so that if something was contagious, it was contained. So you all know Asclepius because it's staffed uh, surrounded by snakes became the symbol of the American Medical Association and indeed any medical poor. And at the end of the third century, when Rome is fighting the Second Punic War with Hannibal of Carthage, which is, had led to some terrible disasters, Rome reaches out to a city in Asia Minor called Pessinus in what is now central Turkey, very close to where I dig, at the site of Gordian. And they bring the Magna Mater, the great mother goddess, from Asia Minor to Rome. 
at the end of the third millennia, end of the third century, 204 BC. This was a very different kind of cult from Asclepius. And you see the mother goddess here with her patron animal, the lions, and then one of her attendants, the, the god Atis, uh, who was castrated uh, in the myth of the cult. And so one of the idiosyncratic features of the cult was that the priests of the cult had to be castrated before they could enter the priesthood, which horrified the Romans. They weren't expecting this. They only read the abstract <laughs> tenets of the cult rather than the footnotes, which would have indicated castration. And of course, if it became too popular, it's hard to consider that that would have happened, but if it did, then you have, a, in theory, a lot of Roman men joining the cult, they're castrated, they're not having children, and that's going to have an impact on the armies, which is important to you because you're hell-bent on conquering the Mediterranean. So no Roman citizens, no Roman men, could become priests of the cult of the Magna Mater, which I'm sure was just fine with some of them. Um, but nevertheless, it became an important, an incredibly important cult, uh, during the Roman period and was often associated with Roman military victory because of course she comes in at the conclusion of the Second Punic War which the Romans had won over Hannibal. And one of the distinctive features of her temple which is placed at the southwest corner of the Palatine was that there was a sacred black stone that was installed in that temple. This is not the same sacred black stone, this is a second sacred black stone that's brought over from Syria in the early third century AD. But it was probably a meteorite that was regarded as having been sent by Sibylle, by the mother goddess of Asia Minor, and taking the black stone from Asia Minor to Rome literally transported the cult. And sometimes you'll see these black stones in triumphal processions on Roman coins even to the extent that a parasol, an umbrella, will be placed over the black stone as it rides in triumph through the streets of the city, which is, of course, <laughs> unnecessary because it's a stone, but nevertheless, it gives you a sense of the status that was attached to these meteorites that were in turn linked to the, the uh, premier cults of the city. Now, in the third century, the first of the great wars is with Pyrrhus of Epirus. Epirus encompasses what is now Albania uh, and Greece, so on the eastern side of the Adriatic. And what's interesting are the coins that, in essence, summarize the legendary histories of the people who were fighting in this war. So Pyrrhus viewed himself as having been descended from the Homeric Greeks. And so you see his coin. You can barely see his name Pyrrhus here in Greek. You see Thetis, the mother of Achilles, who's carrying the armor that she's going to give to her son during the Trojan War. So his coinage is highlighting the fact that he's descended from the Homeric Greeks. The Roman coinage shows Roma with a Phrygian helmet. This is the kind of cap or helmet that's worn by people from the East. So by this point, Rome had acknowledged her Trojan ancestry. And Troy, of course, is in the East, and so Roma at least initially, will wear some Eastern clothing because Rome hadn't yet been fighting in the East. So Eastern clothing was good. Later it would be bad, but right now it's good. So it was almost as if the Trojan War was being fought again by the descendants of the original Greeks and Trojans. The Romans would win this war, which lasted for five years, and we have one of the souvenirs from the war in this plate from the Italian city of Capena that shows one and a half elephants going through the streets of the city of Rome in a triumphal procession. These were Rome's first elephants. So Pyrrhus is coming from the eastern side of the Adriatic where there aren't any elephants, but he was good friends with Ptolemy II of Egypt where there were elephants. So Ptolemy loans him 20 elephants, and this is the introduction of the elephant into the Italian <coughs> Peninsula. And so it was a great triumphal procession because it's the first time you have elephants parading through the streets of the city, and it was so idiosyncratic <coughs> that they made souvenirs that highlighted it, one of which still survives from the first half of the third century. Now, as these wars become more and more frequent in the third and second centuries BC, we find the conquering generals building what we call manubial temples, victory temples that were financed 
um, from the booty that they had, they had accumulated during their campaigns. And so the better the temple that you built, the more august or the more, uh, the higher was your status or your, rep your reputation in Rome. And so they start out being built of a local stone, travertine or tufa, in time, they're actually built of marble because there was a, an, a, an aristocratic competition among these conquering generals who could build the better temple because they got better press among the people of Rome. And we have some of these, as we call them, manubial temples or victory temples still surviving. You're familiar, many of you, with the victory temples in the Largo, Argentina area where you have four victory temples, one next to the other, spanning a period of 200 years and you see a reconstruction graphically of what those temples looked like that are placed here. It wasn't uncommon for these victory temples to be placed in clusters <clears throat> so that you could co-opt the victory of your predecessor and add your victory to that. So over time you'd have these concentrated victory spaces throughout the city. And one of them we have surviving in pretty good shape. This is probably the Temple of Hercules Victor in the cattle market, the Forum Boarium, next to the Tiber River. You see it here, uh, and then here in detail. This is probably built by a man named Mummius after his conquest of Corinth in Greece in 146 BC. And this is one of the first temples that's built in marble. The Roman architects didn't know how to do it, so they brought in architects from Greece this one is probably built by an architect named Hermodorus of Salamis because they knew how to work in marble as the Italian architects did not because marble sources in Rome or in the Italian peninsula had not yet been located. These temples were decorated with booty from the cities that they had captured. And so as the wars continue, truckloads and truckloads, hundreds of carts, carrying the statues in bronze and marble that had once adorned these cities, they move into Rome, initially in the triumphal processions, so that the people can see the magnitude of the victory, and then often displayed next to the victory temples that had been built by the commander who had engineered the victory. And sometimes the boats carrying these statues sank on their way to Italy, and we find them in underwater archaeology excavations. That may be the case with the so-called Riace bronzes, which were found off the southern coast of Italy at the Italian peninsula in 1972. Then they were in conservation for nearly 10 years. As you see here, two magnificent bronze statues from the middle of the 5th century BC that may have been booty that were intended to decorate a medieval temple, or could conceivably have been intended to decorate an aristocratic house or villa, because eventually the elite of Italy began to realize that they could decorate their gardens with these statues, just as the conquering generals could decorate their medieval <coughs> temples with this kind of booty. And so there was a big art market that developed as of the late third and second centuries BC, which continued throughout the rest of the Republic and into the <coughs> Empire. Now during this period, late second, first centuries BC, there are two major advances in Roman architecture. One is the invention of concrete, which is probably invented sometime in the middle of the second century BC. And you see one of the complexes in central Italy, very close to Rome, that made good use of concrete, the Sanctuary of Fortuna at the site of Palestrina, which is just east of Rome. With this concrete, which was made of a local volcanic sand, called pozzolana, mixed of course with lime and stone or brick, one could build the kinds of structures that had been impossible before. So with monumental arches, with vaults, both barrel vaults and groin vaults, and domes. So it's the beginning of a process that would culminate in the Pantheon, and it makes possible a whole range of hillside sanctuaries in central Italy that have been reconstructed. So this is what we think the Sanctuary of Fortuna at Palestrina originally looked like. And again, without the invention of concrete, none of this would have been possible. The other major advance is marble. As of the middle of the first century BC, they discover reliable sources of marble in northwestern Italy, near the uh, Italian towns of Genoa and La Spezia, at the site of Carrara. 
You can, still, you can see the Carrara quarries here, and they're still being used. And the kinds of techniques that the sculptors who learned their trade uh, at Carrara, the kinds of techniques that they use um, now, that they use now, were the ones that were used in antiquity. So now, if you were to go to Carrara to learn how to carve, you would practice on a finger. You would do a finger until you got it right. And so there would be a pile of fingers next to you <laughs> as you keep doing fingers. Then you do a hand, then you do a toe, then you do a foot, then you do an arm, then you do a leg, and eventually you do the entire body. So you've got anatomical marble pieces as trash in your marble, marble workshop. And when we excavate marble carving studios or schools of sculpture, uh, of ancient Roman date, we find the same sort of thing. There's one at Aphrodisius where you've got sample toes and sample fingers. And clearly they were doing the same thing that had been done at Carrara. Now this discovery enabled a lot more buildings to be built in marble because prior to this date, you had to get the marble from Greece or from Asia Minor. It was expensive. And now you could get it from Italy, put it on a boat, sail it down the western side, uh, of the Italian peninsula, up the Tiber, and into Rome. And so gradually the city of Rome would become, uh, it had been a city of brick, it would become a city of marble, thanks to the efforts of this man, Augustus or Octavian, who was a member of the so-called Second Triumvirate with Mark Antony and a man named Lepidus. This after the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC. And so you see some of their coins here, Mark Antony, who looks nothing like Richard Burton, for those of you who know where that was from, and Cleopatra, who looks nothing like Elizabeth Taylor in 1963, and uh, Octavian or Augustus, who by the same token looks nothing like Rodney McDowell in the same 1963 film, and Augustus was the adopted son of Julius Caesar, so he's the son of the first deified man in the Roman world, and you can see that on his coins, I am the son of a god. Caesar Dewey Filius, with Venus, the mother of Aeneas, the matriarch of the Julian family, represented on the coins, which shows by extension that Augustus, like Caesar, could trace his descent up the Julian family tree to Aeneas and thus to Venus, and thus for that matter to Jupiter. Now, with the rise of Augustus, who of course would defeat Mark Antony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, there's a whole new outlook, a whole new perspective in Rome. What had been retrospective before now becomes prospective. So there's a focus on youth, whereas there had been a focus on age in the past. And you would have seen this as you walked through the streets of Rome. This is the kind of portrait that would have been done during the second and first centuries BC, the so-called veristic portrait, where you wanted as many sags, bags, and wrinkles on your face as possible to show the extent to which you had toiled for the good of the Republic. But with the reign of Augustus, everybody looks young. Everybody gets a portrait that's idealized without anatomical imperfections, and you continue to look young even when you're old. So it would have been jarring, this change from late Republican verism to early Roman imperial or Augustan idealization. We've seen this ourselves in 1960-61, where one went from the verism of Dwight Eisenhower to the idealization of John Kennedy. It would have been the same kind of shift that you would have seen in the 30s BC in Rome. Now, after the victory of Augustus over Cleopatra, this brings Egypt under Roman control, and there's an enormous celebration of Rome's conquest of Egypt. So you'll see crocodiles on Roman coins with the legend, Egypt has been subdued. You'll see crocodiles who are on chains or on leashes on Roman coins, and the area where the battle occurred Actium in what is now northwestern Greece, you have a phenomenal victory monument with the bronze ship beaks from Cleopatra's navy inserted into the triumphal monument. Uh, we don't have any of these still surviving, but one of these types of prows has been excavated in fairly recent times um, near Haifa, off the coast of Israel, this one dating to the second century BC, and that's a fairly good indication of the kind of decoration that you would have had uh, in the Actium Memorial. 
Now, after this point, there's a kind of Egyptianizing of Rome. Everyone is wild for Egyptian motifs, uh, Egyptian decorative uh, themes. And so Rome almost begins to look like an Egyptian city. Let me show you a few examples. So here's the Mausoleum of Augustus, built in 28 BC, which has two obelisks taken from Egypt at the entrance to the building, one of which is now in, the, in Piazza dell'Esquilino, um, one in, uh, on the Quirinal Hill. So they still survive intact, nearly 15 meters high. These obelisks are taken by Augustus readily from Egypt and gradually begin to adorn the major public spaces of the city. One of the most prominent, which now survives in Piazza di Montecitorio here, was the pointer of an orologium, a solar meridian clock in downtown Rome. You can see a reproduction of the clock here with the obelisk casting a shadow at specific times of the day and year. And this area was excavated by the Germans in the 1970s. And here is that clock, the pavement of the clock. You can see the end of Leon or Leo, so the zodiac sign, and the beginning Parthenos, Virgo, the zodiac sign, and Atesiae Palantai, in Greek, the Atesian winds cease. So this is something that happens at the, in late August. The winds no longer come in from Africa, but they do um, earlier in August. So all of these are obelisks. Uh, on the one hand, highlighting the culture of Egypt, but on the same, by the same token, symbolizing Roman triumph over Egypt. You see it also in pyramids that are built as tombs in downtown Rome, which is really striking. The Pyramid of Cestius, built at the end of the first century BC, still survives. There was another one near Vatican City, um, and this was believed to be the tomb of Romulus in the Middle Ages, uh, as this was believed to be the tomb of Remus. So it's ironic that in time, pyramids were believed to be the tombs of the founders of the city of Rome. This one was taken apart in the stone used to build the steps of St. Peter's Basilica, but this one still survives. So this is extraordinary. Rome conquers Egypt, but in terms of the decorative arts, Egypt conquers Rome. And this is not so surprising. You think of Napoleon's conquests in Egypt, Napoleon conquers Egypt, but Paris begins to look like an Egyptian city, just as Rome had after Actium. So the clocks look Egyptian, you get sphinxes everywhere, you get some obelisks. It's the same sort of tendency where the area where you're fighting will have a major effect on the decorative arts of the culture who's doing the fighting. If you look at America during the Vietnam War, you see the same sort of thing. Eastern clothing suddenly becoming popular, Eastern cuisine, Eastern cults. This is all happening in the middle of the Vietnam War. It's part of the same phenomenon. Now, in the middle of the first century AD, we move to the end of Augustus's dynasty, the Julio-Claudian dynasty, and the reign of Nero, who will bring down the dynasty. It's during this period when there's a major fire in 64 AD that sweeps through the city and gives Nero a blank canvas where he can do whatever he wants. So he would have been like Peter Ustinov in Provatus, <laughs> looking at an area and deciding what he wanted to build and how he wanted to build it. And so in downtown Rome, he built his golden palace, the Domus Aurea. This is essentially a country villa set in the middle of downtown Rome. It was fine to have a villa in the country, but not to have the country villa in the middle of the city, as Nero will now do. And of course, one of the dominating elements was the Colossus of Nero, this gilded bronze statue of Nero as the sun god, which was called the Colossus and would in time give the name Colosseum to the Flavian Arena that was set up next to it. And this palace obviously occasioned a great deal of comment in antiquity, especially the dining room, which allegedly had a ceiling that revolved as you ate. Now, this is going to be put out of business by Nero's suicide in 68. And at that point, the successors to Nero, the Flavians, would build a monumental arena for the benefit of the people. Nothing like this had ever been constructed before in downtown Rome with a seating capacity of about 50,000. And it still survives in relatively good shape. So you see its size dedicated in 80 AD and what it would have looked like in full operation. 
with the lower rooms under the wooden floor used for sets and animals and, of course, gladiators. And this was in use for a very long period of time. Uh, for gladiatorial games, it was in use until the 5th century AD, animal combats until the 6th century AD, and these combats could go on a long time. According to our sources, when the Colosseum was dedicated in 80 AD, there were 9,000 animals that were slaughtered during the games, which went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. If you're going to have that, not every contest, contest can be a giraffe against an ostrich. You just can't have that done ad infinitum. People would get bored and go home. So you need to have exotic animals coming into the Colosseum. The more exotic, the better. And so this gives rise to an uptick in the exotic animal export industry, and a lot of people got rich as a consequence. Now, I mentioned that the Colosseum survives intact and is used in the late antiquity, the 5th and 6th century AD. And I now want to move to late antiquity and toward the end of this talk. What happened in late antiquity? A lot of different things. If you look here at the temple of the emperors and empress Antoninus Pius and Faustina in the center of the Roman Forum, built in the second century AD, one of the premier imperial cult temples in the Roman Forum. By late antiquity, with the change in religion from paganism to Christianity, it had become part of a monastery. So what had been the interior of the temple is now an open courtyard, and the areas of the monastery had been built in areas that had been the outskirts or the surroundings of the temple. And then, as we move a little further on, the elements of the temple that had fallen down through neglect or through earthquake are burned in lime kilns. And if you burn marble, it turns into lime. You can use the lime as an ingredient of the concrete that you need to build the early Christian churches that are necessary because the religious system of the, Mes of the um, Mediterranean has just changed in the fourth century AD. And at the same time, as unemployment climbs, um, as inflation rises, as the economy worsens, people want to get something for nothing. And in particular, they want to get iron and lead without having to work to get it, or at least without having to mine it and to smelt it. And so what they do is to dig into the buildings and pry out the metal clamps that have been holding the blocks together. So if you look at the Colosseum, you see all these holes. You've probably seen them before, and maybe you didn't think anything about them. Marble termites of some sort. <laughs> but in fact, this is people chiseling into the building every place the blocks come together because they can pry out the clamps. And then, again, you had metal, not without any work, but without having to do the, the spade work that had initially been done in order to procure the metal. And as a result, the building becomes destabilized, and then when Mussolini triples the birth rate in the early 20th century, and the automobile enters the equation, then you have a lot more cars moving around the Colosseum, and the blocks no longer held by clamps are prone to fall off. So it all has a, uh, an effect that you don't initially see. I mentioned the change in religion. This is due to Constantine the Great, whose arch you see here. And during this period, we see a change in religious structures. Most Greek and Roman temples were religions of the exterior. The temple had no windows, nor did it need windows, because it was simply an enclosure for the cult statue. All religious activity took place at an altar outside the building. But with Christianity coming in in the early 4th century, the cult was practiced in interior settings. So you needed a new type of building, the basilica, and you needed windows in it because people had to be able to see what they were doing. And the triumphal arch plays a major role here. It had been a symbol of political triumph before. It would now be built in the interior of the building, over the altar, and would commemorate religious triumph. So it's the same form, but now with a religious meaning rather than a political one. And you see Constantine here, and on the coinage that was struck after his death, where he's going up in a chariot, which is the usual mode of conveyance for dead emperors, but now he's reaching out to the hand of the Christian God, which emanates from the clouds. 
And of course, the other major development was the move uh, from Rome of the capital to Constantinople. What had been Byzantium in, north, in what is now northwestern Turkey would become Constantinople and then would ultimately in the 20th century become Istanbul. And Constantine sets it up to be a new Rome, viewing it as a second Rome. And so you see the usual Roman features, obelisks brought into the city, a Lupercal, Romulus and Remus uh, under the wolf, monumental columns that supported statues, similar to the columns of Trajan and Marcus Aurelius, triumphal arches. It becomes a kind of new Rome with all the famous trappings, or the customary trappings of Rome, reproduced or actually transported from ancient Rome to Constantinople, as it becomes a new capital of the empire. And that, of course, would collapse with the Ottoman conquest in 1453, and then there would be a third Rome that would develop in Moscow, which began referring to itself as the Third Rome, because John III, Ivan III, who ruled at the time of the conquest of Constantinople, was married to the niece of the last Byzantine emperor of the Byzantine Empire. And so he claimed the rights to Rome and said, we are now the Third Rome, and there will never be a fourth Rome because Moscow will never be destroyed. And, and, it, and in fact, it continues on, um, stronger as the days go by. And in order to <laughs> indicate that Moscow was now the third Rome, there was a new title for the ruler. The ruler was now the Tsar, after Caesar. So he takes the title of power that signified Roman rule and implants it into Moscow. Later, some would argue that there was a fourth Rome, as Napoleon is crowned Holy Roman Emperor, uh, as he makes Rome the second capital of his empire, and as he begins major excavations in the Colosseum and in the Forum, and gradually starts replicating the standard features of Rome as Constantine had done in Constantinople. And you're familiar with some of them, the helical column, the Vendôme column in Paris, and the Arc de Triomphe, which of course is modeled on the Arch of Constantine. In short order, Paris begins looking like Rome, as Constantinople and other cities had been. And then Mussolini comes in, in the 20s, 30s, and early 40s, and seeks to remake Rome in his own image using again the standard symbols of ancient Roman power, like the Colosseum, as a component of his new propaganda, and again building obelisks as a symbol of resuscitated ancient Roman power. Many of you are familiar with this one, Mussolini Dux, which stands at the um, Stadio Olimpico in Rome. It's never been defaced, even after Mussolini's downfall, and it's a symbol of the recreated Roman Empire in that Mussolini saw himself as Augustus reborn. He had major celebrations in 1937 on the occasion of the 2,000th year anniversary of the birth of Augustus, which is again in the 1930s, and a new spotlight falls on Rome, both ancient Rome and modern Rome as the reconstruction of ancient Rome, and Hollywood takes notice but it takes notice in a way that's different from what Mussolini is doing, using ancient Rome as a way of proselytizing Christianity. So movie after movie during the Depression comes out that shows a corrupt Rome that is redeemed by an infusion of Christian values. We see this over and over again. So Rome fulfills a new purpose in propaganda than it had done before, and it would continue to serve new purposes as the decades would pass by in Hollywood, the most potent of which was Spartacus. What is Spartacus? It's a movie about a slave. People were um, horrific to that slave. Spartacus, of course, led a slave rebellion in the 70s BC, which um, succeeded for a number of years before it was put down. And Kirk Douglas makes this film with a screenplay written by Dalton Trumbo of the power of the slave over imperial Rome. And he makes it in the wake of Rosa Parks' refusal to get off her seat on the bus. He makes it as a way of making a comment 
on the burgeoning civil rights movement in America. Sometimes it's easier for us to understand and to deal with military combat and social conflict by viewing it through the lens of antiquity rather than head on. The fact that we see these books about Vietnam and Iraq, Ajax in Iraq, Odysseus in America, uh, Achilles in Vietnam is a case in point, and so is Spartacus as a comment on the American civil rights movement in the late 1950s. And so again, Rome is fulfilling a different role. This is as far as I can take you in 50 minutes, but I hope from this lecture you will have acquired a sense of the multifaceted nature of Rome, and I hope you will have gotten a sense that Rome has by no means surrendered all of its secrets. <clears throat> as I mentioned, as each new trench is laid for a new subway station in the city, great discoveries are made. The last of which was a set of rhetorical rooms, a kind of university that was discovered a few years ago, linked to the libraries of the Forum of Trajan with the seats where the students would have sat, still clad in marble and still in phenomenal shape. And as these subway systems continue to be dug and surrendered, because what is found is more valuable than the station would be, we can look forward to more such sensational discoveries. So think of Rome not just as a city, but as a concept that can be manipulated and exploited as a model by cities and empires, both east and west, each of which attempts to create a new Rome in its own image. So thank you for listening to me tonight. Okay, and thank you also for having seen all of those movies from the 30s to the 50s that I showed because when I show them in my classes, the students look at me with total confusion. Yes, sir? So, you told us about concrete, but... Hey, just, just one second. Um, Nick, do we need microphones for the audience members? For yes. Rochelle? Yes, I got it. Just so that everyone can hear. Uh, gentlemen, yes. Great talk. Um, you told us about concrete. Uh, what can you tell us about the history of the arch? The history of the arch, well, the arch, per se, goes back to Mesopotamia in the third millennium BC, but it's made of mud brick. Then you get arches that are made of stone in the fourth century BC. Some of you have been to Macedonia <clears throat> in what is now northeastern Greece, and you've seen the barrel vaulted uh, chambers of the tombs of the Macedonian kings. Vergina is perhaps the most famous example. So a barrel vault, you take an arch, you generate it along a straight line, and the form that you get looks like you've uh, cut off the upper half of a barrel. Then if you intersect that barrel, that barrel vault with another barrel vault uh, at right angles, you get a groin vault which enables you to build an even stronger building that's multi-story. Our earliest groin vaults, I think, are first century BC, uh, and that's true as well for domes, but the dome is not really, I mean, we get phenomenal domes that are built already in the first century BC in the Golden House of Nero, but nothing beats the Pantheon under Hadrian in the early 2nd century AD and the work of his architect Apollodorus of Damascus. So arch, per se, goes back to 3rd millennium BC, in stone in the 4th century BC, uh, continues on into Rome in concrete in the 2nd century BC, uh, and then begins to be part of a sophisticated system of vaulting in the 1st centuries BC and AD. Yes, sir, um, in the maroon sweat. Yes? Is there any evidence of an actual Romulus? An actual what? Evidence of the fact that it was a Romulus or something like that. Is there any evidence uh, of a Romulus? What we do have evidence of is occupation on the Palatine Hill in the 8th century, and it seems the creation of a ditch and a, a defensive ditch and a fortification wall that, is, that was excavated a few decades ago that has been dated to the 8th century BC. So it looks like there is a fortified settlement that goes up on the Palatine Hill in the 8th century BC. That is the age in which Romulus reportedly lived, 
uh, again, having founded Rome in 753 BC. So do we have evidence that there was a king named Romulus? We don't. Do we have evidence for a sophisticated settlement being created on the Palatine Hill where Romulus reportedly first built the city um, in the 8th century? We do. Uh, yes, Rochelle, I'll, I'll let you move the microphone to the point that's easiest uh, for you. Thanks, Ben Tom, was great. Thank you. Uh, could you clarify the, the meaning of the word basilica? From what I understand, it was a, at least from my understanding, was uh, it was a Roman law court that eventually became, you know, cathedral like uh, setting for a Christian church. But I'm not sure. If you could... uh, basilica uh, is a Latin word, but it comes from the Greek basileos, which is the word for king in Greek. And so you ask a good question. We don't have answers with great uh, clarity on this issue. We think that it was first used for some kind of structure that was in the service of the cult of the kings, the royal cult. Cult of, well, there were no emperors, but cult of the rulers and cults of the kings in Greece in the wake of Alexander the Great, so in the third and second centuries BC. And then it comes to Rome in the early second century BC. Our earliest basilicas are early second century BC. And the title, the name suggests that it's been imported from Greece. So some sort of large space that was intended for a gathering. And that gathering may have started off as being some sort of celebration of the cult of the kings. And then, once it was transplanted to Rome, it became an ideal location for law courts or for any interior, interior gathering. And then in the fourth century, once Christianity takes off, they recognize it as the ideal building type for the Christian service because it's stable, it's well lit, um, large groups can gather, you can put in an apse and have that as the center of the altar. Uh, and people will still be able to see it because these are solid rectangular structures. Uh, and so it continues on as the ideal early Christian space uh, as of the fourth century AD. Uh, yes, Rochelle is. Um, uh, uh, yes. Yes, isn't Washington, D.C. also considered to be a Rome? Because a lot of the structures that were put up, like the Jefferson Memorial and others, and some of the leaders are considered like Roman emperors. <laughs> I want three more. I have my own point of view, of course. Um, Washington is a mixture of Athens and Rome. You're absolutely right. And certainly when one looks at the Lincoln Memorial, it's a building surrounded by columns. It looks like a Roman temple. And inside, there's a colossal cult statue of a ruler. And so if you had gone into a temple of Augustus in the ancient Mediterranean, it would have been a building surrounded by columns with a colossal cult statue of a ruler with a monumental inscription of the statements of Augustus on the wall. And when you go into the Lincoln Memorial, that's exactly what you have. Even though Lincoln is dressed more appropriately than Augustus, at least to our eyes. But the Lincoln Memorial is often cited as an example of the Roman ruler cult in operation in America. Yes. I have nothing but respect for Lincoln, let me add that. <laughs> Two things. Uh, you mentioned uh, how Rome had been exported to other cities. And the marble and the ruler in gold on top of the, the pillar reminded me of Ashgabat. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 good. Bravo. For life put himself on <clears throat> I'm, I'm delighted that you brought that up because most pe most audiences don't bring up the capital of Turkmenistan in the question and answer session. But since you have, <laughs> let me just comment on that. I couldn't agree more with your statement. For those of you who are not aficionados of Ashgabat, the capital of Turkmenistan, the former dictator, a man named Niyazov, or Turkmenbasha, had a colossal statue of himself erected, which moves with the course of the day. And so his arms are like this, and he moves as the sun moves, so that the sun always shines in the palm of his hand. And so that is very close to the gilded bronze statue of Nero as a colossal sun god. It's the importance of the sun in royal imagery on a colossal scale. 
and it shows that what worked in ancient Rome can still work in 20th century Turkmenistan, 20th century Central Asia. Yes, yes, yes. My other question was more prosaic. How low did the population of Rome go in the Dark Ages uh, and late antiquity? Uh, right. We, these are very difficult to estimate, population estimates. I said that I thought uh, at the end of the 4th century population was about 60,000. It's usually believed to have been about 200,000 in 200 BC, to have been about a million um, during the High Empire, and is now 3 million. Um, during, we don't say Dark Ages anymore because it's pejorative. Um, we would say Late Antiquity. Um, which doesn't sound as negative. Uh, it went pretty low. I, there are probably population estimates. Um, many left the city because, of course, there was plague that swept through much of the Mediterranean in the 6th century AD, the, um, and there were also earthquakes. The waterways um, gradually silted up. Uh, they turned into swamps. The swamps would attract mosquitoes. They would spread malaria. They were no longer safe areas in which to live. So I can imagine that it may have been, I mean, at its lowest, it was probably 20,000. Uh, may even have been less than that, but probably was not more than that during something like the 7th century, which was a, a low point in terms of population and in terms of health. Um, okay, I'll come to you next. Yes? Do we know anything about the uh, genetic background of the early Roman people? Were they related at all to the Greek people in Troy? The, okay, the, 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 the Trojans were, were not Greek. Um, they, we can say they were Anatolian. But uh, the Greeks certainly traded with Western Asia Minor, but the Trojans were not Greek. Uh, they, they lived in what is now uh, northwestern Turkey. Um, do we have any evidence that the Romans and the Trojans come from the same stock? Zero. Um, if you look at Latin uh, and you compare it to Luvian, which is probably the language that was used by the Trojans in the late Bronze Age, there's no connection whatsoever. You look at the DNA, no, I mean, you know, we're all related if you take it all the way back, but um, no strong connection between uh, Asia Minor and, uh, and Italy. Um, it's hard to chart the development of that story. By the 5th century BC, there was the story that Aeneas had escaped Troy before it was completely destroyed and had gone to the west, to the area of Italy. Um, the Lydians, uh, a kingdom in west central Turkey, claimed that they had sent settlers to central Italy and that those settlers were the forerunners of the Etruscans, so that they had essentially colonized Etruria. So there were a number of stories about people from Asia Minor going to Italy and serving as the founders. But if you look at the archaeological evidence, we don't have a shred of evidence that would indicate that that actually did happen. Uh, okay, Rochelle, we have a question down here. And I'm afraid this is going to be the last question. Thank you. Uh, regarding the enormous wealth of Rome, uh, what do you think is the relative, was the relative importance uh, between the, um, uh, the conquests and, the, and the, the wealth that came from the conquests as, uh, as compared to the, uh, the free labor of the slaves? Where, I mean, which was more important than there other sources of wealth? I, I don't know that I can rank them in order of importance. Certainly the slaves were a phenomenal source of, uh, of a phenomenal workforce, constituted a phenomenal workforce for the city. The Jewish slaves that were brought into Rome after the Roman-Jewish wars in the late 60s, early 70s, I mean, they were among those who built the Colosseum. I mean, monumental structures were built with slave labor that otherwise wouldn't have been able to have been built. More and more slaves coming in as the range of, as the scope of conquest broadened. So that was certainly vital. As the range of conquest broadened, and as more and more booty came into the city, obviously the city per se became wealthier, and many of these complexes that I showed were able to be built. Trajan's Forum, 
which is the largest of the imperial fora in Rome, is built on the backs of the ancient Romanians, the Dacians. All that booty from Dacia enables Trajan to embark upon a phenomenal building program in the city of Rome. So as the empire expands, all of the resources of the empire come under the control of Rome. So it was all part of an enormous network that was incredibly well managed until the early third century when the borders of the empire begin to crumble and it's far more difficult to maintain the stability of the borders with the lack of stability that there had been in the first and second centuries AD. The economy goes into a tailspin and um, unemployment, um, inflation, etc. rise dramatically and it's only in the late third century when the emperor Diocletian decides to create a, qu um, a, a quadripartite division of the empire, that that provides the kind of administrative framework that enables it to survive for some time. But Constantine realized that if it was going to survive moving into the fourth century, the capital had to be moved further east. And in fact, that did work. The Byzantine Empire that devolved from that move to Constantinople would last in one form or another for more than a thousand years, even though what he had left behind in Rome did not. I read somewhere that one of the economic problems of Rome was that they didn't export anything. They, they only imported. And so it was uh, that led to uh, a sloth and, and uh, people. That's certainly true. I mean, they, the grain supplies were coming from Egypt. That's why Egypt was such an important player in the first century BC, and why Caesar and Antony and Augustus, for that matter, were so concerned about bringing Egypt under their control. You're absolutely correct. All right, with that, thank you.